Well, here we are already in week five of this message series that we're calling Riding the Storm Out, this message series where we have been uh, learning from the life of Job. And uh, today we're going to continue with that, and then next week on Palm Sunday, we're going to wrap up this series with a message titled, God's Answer to the Struggles of This World Is... Now, the, the original message title that, uh, that I borrowed from someone else was God's answer to the struggles of this world is God, but I'm not sure that maybe next week on Palm Sunday it shouldn't be God's answer to the struggles of this world is Jesus. But either way, we're going to wrap this up and we're going to hear about that next week. But today, I want us to begin our time in today's message by, by opening our Bible. So hopefully if you have your Bible with you or, or maybe you use a Bible app, I want to invite you to open it to Job chapter 29. If you happen to be uh, following along with the reading plan that we've been uh, doing during this series, you may notice something unusual. It's the first time in this entire message series that the chapter that we're actually reading today is the chapter that I'm preaching from. So we're going to begin our time together by reading Job chapter 29 verses 2 through 6. And this is... Job speaking here. And he says, I long for the years gone by when God took care of me, when he lit up the way before me and I walked safely through the darkness. When I was in my prime, God's friendship was felt in my home. The Almighty was still with me and my children were around me. My steps were awash in cream and the rocks gushed olive oil for me. Those those few verses from chapter 29. And then I'm going to invite you to jump ahead to chapter 30. And we're going to look at verses 16 through 22. And, and all of these verses from both chapters really give us a better understanding of just how Job was feeling in the midst of the storm. Hear what else he has to say. And now my life seeps away. Depression haunts my days. At night my bones are filled with pain which gnaws at me relentlessly. With a strong hand, God grabs my shirt. He grips me by the collar of my coat. He has thrown me into the mud. I'm nothing more than dust and ashes. I cry out to you, O God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. You have become cruel toward me. You use your power to persecute me. You throw me into the whirlwind and destroy me in the storm. Job has been suffering tremendously. He's lost his family, all of his possessions, his reputation, his health. He's, he's longing for things to be like they once were when he felt God close to him and, and his life, if you will, was just going along smooth as butter. But now he's feeling more like a man who's being kicked when he's down. Job is struggling to understand why God is allowing all of these things to happen to him, why God is allowing him to be in this storm in his life being tossed about. And Job is grappling with that very, very tough question of why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? But what we need to understand is Job's struggles weren't just with the things that were happening or had happened to him. Sorry, just a moment here. He, his real struggle was that he was asking, but God wasn't telling him what he'd done wrong. You see, Job believed that if these bad things were happening, then obviously he had done some sort of sin that was causing this. And all he wanted God to do was tell him what he had done wrong. And, and in Job's mind, if he knew what that was, he, he could... Um, repent of those things and he could offer sacrifices and he could repair his relationship with God and things would go back to the way they once were. And so Job feels like, however, that God's not listening. And like we just read a few moments ago, 
Job says, I cry out to you, O God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. To, to paraphrase Job a little bit, it's like Job is saying, God, I'm trying not to be angry with you, but I've got some questions that you need to answer for me. You know, as we've been talking about throughout this entire series, people, you and I, all of us, will go through storms in our life. And whether we are ones who consider ourselves religious or not, it doesn't matter whether it's us or who it is, all people are going to go through storms. And whether they consider themselves religious or not, they're going to go through those periods where they're going to see something happening in their life and they're going to go, what the heck, God? What, what are you doing? And looking out at those of you here this morning, some of you can relate, I imagine. Some of you can relate to that feeling of something happening in your life and just wanting to shout out to God, Why, God? Where are you? What are you doing? Maybe in those rough times in your life, in those storms in your life, you've had that occasion where you have voiced your anger or your frustration that you've, that about something that you felt God had done to you. And in doing that, maybe you met with some disapproval from some of your Christian friends, from some of your good friends. Maybe, like me, you've even had somebody tell you at one time, hey, hey, you can't talk about God like that. You can't argue with God. And even though that's how we feel in the middle of those storms, most of us do feel a bit unsettled to be questioning God or to be arguing with God. I mean, after all, questioning God and what He's doing implies that we're thinking God's done something wrong. And if, and if we believe that God is good and perfect, which we all should, then that can't be the case, right? And while some people will contend that questioning God like that shows a lack of faith, I want you to know this morning that, that I don't believe that. I disagree with that. Which is the reason for today's sermon title, It's Okay to Question God. It's okay for us to question God in the middle of the storms. It's okay to question God in the, in the middle of the calm. It's okay to bring our questions to God. Throughout the Bible, we can find story after story after story that, that shows us exactly that, that God allows us to, to challenge, to resist, to complain, and yes, to even at times question Him. In Genesis chapter 18, Ab Abraham argued with God. In Exodus chapter 32, a guy named Moses questioned God. If you go to the New Testament, to Mark chapter 7, there's an unnamed woman there who actually disagrees with something that Jesus said. And then read the Psalms. The Psalms are often filled with deep, honest questions of people in pain and confusion and abandonment and loss. And so yes, friends, it is okay for us to question God. As long as we keep in mind that our human tendency is in situations like those when we start, what our human tendency is when we start questioning people. In other words, what I, what I mean is sometimes when we get into a discussion, when we get into a debate, when we begin our question, questioning others, our reasonable discussion can sometimes turn into, I'm right and you're wrong. You know what I'm talking about, right? Our, our beginning, our questioning can turn into our pointing fingers and saying, nope, you're wrong and I'm right. And what happens is, quite often, those discussions, those times of questioning, turns into that one person wanting so badly to prove that they are right in that moment, wanting so badly to get the last word in, that they're the ones yelling at the top of their voice. And so, just like there's a right way and a wrong way for us to question others, 
we need to keep in mind when we are questioning God that there's a right way and a wrong way to go about it. One is destructive and harmful and, and most often will lead us to walk away hurt and angry. And the other is constructive and helpful and, and will lead us to new discovery and new truth. And the good news is, as we look at the life of Job, Job offers us some surprising lessons about how we can go about questioning God, how we can live into that time of questioning God in the storms. And so I've got three points. If you want to write them down, uh, there's room on the back of your bulletin. And, and the first point is this. As we're, looking at the, as we're looking at the life of Job, the one thing we learn is that God allows Job to be honest. God allows Job time to be honest about how he's feeling. For all of his rants and his ravings, at the very end of the story, Job is said to have spoken correctly about God. Here's what it says in chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. Reading through the book of Job, you'll notice that God never just steamrolls or runs over Job's feeling. God never scolds Job for sharing his emotions or his despair or even at times his frustration. God didn't strike him dead or as I like to say, he didn't smote him with a lightning bolt. Instead, for 38 chapters, God just allowed Job the space to be honest. God allowed Job the space to be honest. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called, uh, titled The Problem of Pain, and in that book he writes these words, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Job asked God some really tough questions. Some of them may be ones that you yourself have asked of God before at some maybe some tough time in your life and 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 that's okay that's what I want you to hear today that's okay because holding back our feelings or our our frustrations towards God in the midst of the storm is never a good thing for us to do because quite often what it will cause us to do is to walk away from God in the midst of the storm the truth is our emotions, our feelings, what's going on that comes spewing out of us doesn't scare God at all. And, and so we need to be honest about them because the Bible tells us that God hears it all, but God is always faithful. Point number two, God not only allowed Job to be honest, but Job seeks God. Job sought out God. Despite his anger and his frustration, Job did something in this huge storm in his life that, that many of us, it's not the first thought we have when our lives are being hit by a storm. He rushes to God rather than away from him. I got to be honest, there have been times in my life where I felt like God wasn't there where I felt like stuff was going on around me or with my family, and, and I thought that God wasn't listening and, and he had forgotten me. He wasn't answering my prayers as I had laid them up to him, and so I just decided to avoid God. If he wasn't there, I wasn't going to be there for him, and so I would stop reading my Bible and I stopped praying and, and I retreated into complaining and groaning and bitterness. You see, I didn't see a need to turn to God because, after all, why should I trust to God when I knew there was a God, but I felt like He wasn't really there or He wasn't listening? But what we learn from Job's life is Job didn't do that. Job didn't do what was our normal human tendency. He doesn't shut God out. He doesn't turn inward to himself and just sit in his own self-pity and cynicism, cynicism for very long. Instead, 
He continues to call out to God. He continues to ask for answers to his questions. And when God begins to speak, as we heard last week in last week's message, when God begins to speak, that's when the real healing begins for Job. But what's interesting and what I want you to think about today and know about Job today is, is it wasn't the suffering in the storm that made Job a better person at the end of the story. It wasn't his suffering that made him a better person. It was God's presence that made him a better person. Job could have sat in that storm and never gotten any better, never gotten any understanding, but he kept looking to God. And when God finally made his presence known, which God was there all along, so it was really more like when Job finally realized God's presence, that's when the real healing took place. Imagine for a moment, friends, think about maybe those those storms in your life, those tough times in your life, or, or perhaps imagine some to come and what could happen in our own lives if we kept pursuing God in those storms in those tough times just like God did. What difference, what a difference it would make for us. So God allows Job to be honest. Job seeks out God. And then the final thing is Job wanted to meet with God more than he wanted answers from God. Job wanted to meet with God more than he wanted the answers. There's no doubt that Job wanted answers. We, we saw that for many, many chapters, but, and he, and he, and he didn't do everything right, okay? I, I want you to know that, that our struggling with God, our questioning God, that there's going to be times where we're not going to do it right, and, and Job didn't do it right. There were times where he said some pretty harsh and, and even some things that, we might take to be a bit irreverent speaking to the God of all creation. But ultimately, in the end of the story here, as we get to this end of the story, what we're really finding out and what we heard in the passages we read today, what Job wanted most of all was a connection with God. What Job wanted most of all was just to feel close to God again. And what we need to understand is Satan, Satan was the one that said to God, go ahead and let me mess with your buddy Job, right? Let me mess with your guy Job. Because what Satan wanted Job to do in the midst of the storm was turn and hightail it, was to turn away from God, was to stop seeking after God, to stop wanting to connect with God. But Job never let go of that. Just like God never let go of him. And as we read in chapter 29 today, Job continued to long for those years gone by like it used to be when God took care of him and when he could feel God's friendship and when God was still with him in his life and in his home and in his family. And in the end, in the end you're going to read and find out that Job repents because he recognized how wrong he was, and, and, and not only how he questioned God's morality and justice, but also, most importantly, how he questioned God's presence with him. In, in Job chapter 42, the second half of verse 3, he says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Job realized at the end, God had been there. He just didn't understand how God was working in the midst of his storm. As I said earlier, it's, it's kind of our human nature when things aren't going like we want to, to vent and to scream and to prove that we're right and maybe God or whoever else it is is wrong. And just like many of our own human relationships, our relationship with God can only grow and thrive if we are willing to understand who God is rather than accuse and abuse the God that we think we know. There's no doubt that what happened to Job was truly unfair. But he heard 
in the end what God told him and he and he had the humility to respond to God in faith he had the humility to to humble himself and repent and seek God's forgiveness and while it's way easier at least for me I can't speak for you but I imagine it's the same for you while it is way easier for us to be angry at God in the storms rather than engage with him and try to get a grasp on what's going on we need to keep the lines of communication open. In other words, it is way easier for us in the storms of life to walk away from God, but we need to take a cue from Job and we need to run to God. We need to keep going to God. Because just like God did for Job, God is inviting us to listen. God is inviting us as we are riding out the storm to trust in Him. And here's the, the good news lesson, as I call it, for today, and that's this. No matter how bad they are, no matter how messy they are, God can handle all of our emotions. God can handle all of our crap and our stuff and our complaints and our questions. God can handle all the messy stuff in our life. And, and so when our life gets tough, when we find ourselves in the storm, we need to know and remember always that God can handle our anger and our questions. And the reason I tell you that is because as you read the book of Job, you're going to find out that God was way bigger than all of Job's questions, and God will be way bigger than all of ours too. Let's pray about that, shall we? Let's pray. God, thank you that in spite of our lack of understanding exactly who you are or what you're doing, you know exactly what is best for us. And you promise always to work for our good, not just for our momentary happiness, but for our eternal goodness. Thank you that in all situations, in all pain and in all pressures and all circumstances that just seem to be beyond our control, that you are still making us more and more like Jesus each and every time we let go of our own will and we surrender to yours. God, thank you that the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please you. And so God, today we pray that this day and each day ahead that, that we choose to believe that you do have it all under control, that even when things are out of control for us, they are perfectly under your control. God, thank you for being good and loving, all-knowing and an ever-present God. A God who will never let anything touch us that hasn't first passed through your own hands. God, thank you. Thank you for your gift of love to us for your gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And it is in his name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to invite the band to uh, begin making their way back up to the stage as we get ready to, to uh, end the service with another song. But as they're making their way back up, I just want to remind you that this would be a great time, if you haven't already done so, to finish filling out your connection card. And, and you can drop that with your offering in the offering box as you leave. And, and thank you. Thank you for your gifts of not only money, but your gifts of service to this church. Everything that you generously give allows us to do the ministry that we do through Crosswind. I do want to remind you, uh, we've got a few things happening this week and in the weeks ahead. Tomorrow night we are restarting Table Talk. Um, if you're not familiar completely with what Table Talk is, we... Uh, we meet at 7 o'clock. Some of us get there at 6.30ish. We, we have a meal. You can have something to drink if you'd like. And um, I usually come up with some interesting questions kind of pulled out of current events. And we, we just have a time sitting around the table with each other uh, discussing where our life and where real life and our faith actually meet. And so... If ever you'd like to be a part of that, you are welcome to join. You don't need to sign up. But yes, Jody. Oh, a 
bonus, a bonus. All right, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a great, a great thing. Thank you, Jody, for letting me know that. Uh, Tuesday, don't forget, uh, last week, I apologize, I had a migraine and, and kind of had to cancel, but this Tuesday, I'm going to be doing another Tuesday tune-up where we're going to look at a few things I wasn't able to cover in today's message. Um, I'm not going to be on Zoom. I'm going to be live on Facebook, though, at 7 o'clock. It goes from about 7 to 7.30, so if you have access to Facebook, want to join me, uh, please uh, please come on board and uh, listen in to what we've got going on. And then um, Good Friday, April 2nd is coming, and we are going to have a Good Friday service here that Friday night. And um, it'll begin at 7 o'clock, and again, it's going to be a, a fairly brief service, um, you know, half hour, maybe 45 minutes. Um, but I always tell everybody, I don't believe we can fully grasp and understand and celebrate the joy of Easter without witnessing the tough times of Good Friday. And this year, I'm going to be bringing a, a message, a conversation, not just about the one cross, but we're going to be looking at Luke's version of the Good Friday events and talking about Jesus and the two thieves or criminals, the two other guys that were hanging there with him. So I hope you'll come and be part of that uh, Friday evening, April 2nd. And then last thing, most of you don't fit in the proper age group, but you still need to know about this. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt here on our West Lawn on Easter Sunday. Um, we have, we're doing things a little different this year. It's going to start right at 11.45. That gives us a few minutes after second service is done. But we are asking folks to pre-register. Uh, that just gives us a little better idea of who may be coming from not only our congregation, but from the community, how many kids are going to be there. So if you know of someone that may be interested, please pass that message along. Have them contact the church office by Friday, April 2nd. Just leave us their name, phone number, number of kids and their ages. Um, and uh, we're going to make sure we have a good time on Easter Sunday. With that, I want to invite you, uh, come back next week. Again, like I said, let's wrap this series up talking about Jesus. So let's stand if you're able and let's join our voices in our